Good morning, Village Church. So good to be with you this morning. My name is Victor, I'm lead pastor here at this location, and we have a doozy this morning. I'm so excited. We have so much text to get through. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna feel like we're on, jumping on a moving train and this train is on fire at times. And if we don't have all the text up here, so if you wanna follow along, there's some key passages here you wanna follow along, I encourage you to open your Bibles. But hey, if you're new with us, that we're jumping into a series called The Gospel of John and we are right starting in chapter 13. So let's go, ready? Let's do this. Chapter 13, verse one, it says, now before this thing, there we go. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, this is heavy, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This is almost like a beautiful little hallmark card for you. But what's happening here, there's almost this turn. The scene is changing in chapter 13. The rest of John, all these chapters before, predominantly Jesus' focus has been outward, public. The vast and the far, traveling all over, doing public ministry, preaching about the kingdom, talking and debating Pharisees. He's not neglecting his disciples, but he's definitely not a focus. And chapter 13, the whole thing pivots. It's like this vignette filter comes on the scene. Remember vignette filters like on Instagram which just came out, we all overuse these dramatic like black and white filters. I don't know if you've gone back to like your original Instagram pictures or Nexo B or whatever. It's a humbling experience. I remember seeing one when I was like 18 years old and I'm like, it's dramatic filters, like brownish gray. And it's like, I swear I'm almost doing like a duck face. I'm just seeing this thing, I'm like, who am I? What have I become? <laughs> and that's what's happening in chapter 13. It's just honing, there's this vignette filter coming on this chapter. And it's zoning in this quiet room, the situation where it says, it's the round dinner and it's his own, the ones he loved here, right to the end. And Jesus knows, it's a dramatic moment because Jesus knows his hour has come. The end is right around the corner. Death sits thick in the air, but not just death for Jesus, also betrayal. In verse 2, it says that Judas, the devil had already put in his heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Like the atmosphere is thick in this room. It's a very intimate moment saying he loved them to the end. How did he do that? How did he show his love? Did he, did he provide like a preaching workshop for them? Hey, hey, this is the best way to have the best impact or have the furthest reach, no? Did he teach them like, here's how to be future leaders of the church like an established, no, he doesn't do that. How to pray, how to evangelize, none of that. In fact, he doesn't say anything. He just stands up. And it's a somber moment. Skipping down to verse four, it says, he rose from supper he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This quiet moment, no one's talking, everyone's trying to figure out what's happening. Something that no Jewish servant would ever do. And definitely the disciples would not do for each other, for their peers. Like, they're almost like brothers. I grew up with two older brothers and sharing and serving each other weren't exactly in our wiring. Like when the dinner table, when we're having dinner together, we're not, you know, the dinner rolls are coming around. We're not like, oh brother, would you like the last dinner? No, no. Teenage brothers, it's like savage. You're grabbing whatever you can, knowing there's not seconds. You're stacking your plate, especially when it's shake and bake night. Ooh. <laughs> it's like a poor man's fine dining. We would, we would literally take as many drumsticks as possible, put it on our plate, and peel off the skin and put it aside, eat the chicken, then partake in the crispy chicken. That sounds really creepy when I say it out loud, but sharing, serving. These aren't exactly things innately wired in who we are. And the disciples, my brothers, none of these people would do what Jesus did. Jesus steps into a need that is below everyone else. To teach something profound to his disciples about the kingdom, yes, of course. But we can't just overlook the simple truth that he did it just because he loves his friends. He loved them to the very end. Like, read the room in this situation, what is happening. 
This is the God of the universe getting low and washing sinners' feet. Simultaneously, he knows his impending death, a brutal and savage death that he's about to wear. It's looming on him. It's wearing him down. So not only in, he's washing his feet in spite of who he is, but what he is facing. And what punches through all that, he's still compelled to love his friends, to put their needs above his, and to give them just some simple comforts and a little bit of luxury. This is the Jesus that is so for you. This is who he is. This is what he does for us. We can't overlook the, the fact that he cares about you. It's not about the, always the mission and what you bring to the table and the kingdom impact, your talents, your gifts, and all this stuff that you, you think you have to serve Jesus all the time. No, no. He just wants to serve you just because he can't help himself because he loves you that much. He's so compelled to do so. I remember going... Uh, on a missions trip, if you've ever traveled overseas or been on a missions trip, you know eating different cultural food, you're rolling the dice. And I remember going to Botswana in Africa, and there's my, my missions team, and we're at this, we're in this church that it's like, it's a tin roof, it's like a sauna. In that day, I, I'll leave out the details, but it was like spring cleaning, like my whole body was just cleaned out. And... I remember sitting at the back pew. I was like forced to come with the team because you have to take along everywhere. And I'm watching them do like a drive up front about the crucifixion or something. And I'm just like sitting in the back, like heaving, cold sweats. Like I'm so pale, paler than I am right now, believe it or not. Like this, and, and I remember at this moment where one of the team leaders, this older lady, comes and sits beside me and says, hey, do you feel like maybe God's teaching you something through this sickness? Like, is there sin that maybe you need to confess? And I'm like on death's corner. And I remember just like, lady, get out of my face and let me die. Like, that was how I felt. I didn't need a lesson. I needed relief. And whatever problems you're facing, no matter how big or how small, Jesus cares about the details. He cares that you get sun, sunlight and you get all the great pictures on your wedding. He cares about those things. He cares that you have comfort. He knows the weight of life. And he loves to provide you just with some simple comfort once in a while. And we can't overlook that. Now, here's the kicker. This is fun. Peter's response. He's washing his disciples' feet. And here's Peter and how he, I love Peter. He's just this radical, awesome dude. He, he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't understand, but you understand later. You understand afterward. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. That's an appropriate response. Like he's a rabbi, he's a disciple, that culturally that is actually a crazy thought for Jesus to wash his feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter, I just picture him standing up in that moment. Lord, not my feet, but my hands and my head. Like everything. If that's what it means to have a share with you, then I have to have it all. John highlights the writer in, in this moment. So far, he's highlighted two disciples, Judas and Peter. Very interesting. Very different trajectories after this dinner. But are they actually all that different, these two? We often tend to demonize Judas. He tends to be the bad guy or the villain in our Sunday school stories. I don't know if any, like, raise of hands, anyone who's named their kid Judas like, it's not exactly, he doesn't have a great reputation in history, right? He tends to be marked as someone that is the evil one, right? But is he actually all that different than any of the other disciples? Let's look at this for a second. Judas had incredible input. Judas had the best small group experience any of us will ever have in all of history. He had front row seat to the best preaching where he could engage and ask questions every day, not just Sunday. He had the best moral example any of us will ever have. He could, he could see how Jesus responded to things, ask questions, answer, ask his own question about how he should do things every day, right there with him. He also had the best ministry training any seminary will ever offer past, present, future in all of history. G Judas had incredible input for three years. And what we also forget is, you can argue, he had incredible output. Here we go. This gets a little controversial. It never says anywhere in history, anywhere in Scripture, that 11 of them in Judas sat out. 
It always says everywhere in scripture, all 12 of them did this. All 12 of them evangelized. All 12 of them taught. Like Judas taught scripture. He taught the Torah. All 12 of them did counseling. All 12 of them cast out demons. Has anyone cast out a demon before? (laughs) They all did all this. You could argue that Judas saw more lives transformed through his ministry than any of us in this room. He had all of this. Input, output. He had the best of the best, and yet he still rejected Jesus. Why? Well, I think the difference between Judas and Peter is is in verse 8, which we read, If I don't wash you, you have no share in me. And Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my feet. Absolute surrender. Peter surrounded surrendered everything to Jesus and his heart. And Judas didn't. One author says about Judas, his disenchantment with Jesus' disavowal of political power or whatever else the taproot of his decision to betray his master gave the devil an opportunity having closed his heart to the light. With all the ministry, with all the teaching from Jesus, Jesus never had Judas' heart. And this cuts me down as a pastor. Or my, my life and my, my role, my, my job description is primarily like, like this stuff. It's output. Religious service, the things, evangelism, teaching, all this stuff. And for me, it's easy to get my identity wrapped up in this. My worth, who I am to God is what I deliver on. And it's the diligent practice of cutting through all the output of the things I can easily impress myself with. Like, like look at me right now. Like, I'm preaching to thousands of people across Canada. Like, Surrey are, are located. We've had some really cool local mission impact stuff. We've, I, I did a couple preaching or some, like, pastoral counseling sessions a week or week or two ago, and I think they went pretty well. Like, I moved people closer to Jesus. Like, I can easily wrap myself, my worth up, and fool myself into thinking this is the stuff that saves me. And I need to cut through all that to get to the most crucial question at the end of the day, does he even have my heart right now? Like, does he have yours? Like, are, are you, you seeing growth in your life? Are you following him? Are you allowing him to lead you? Are you obeying him when he calls you? Like, do you even enjoy Jesus right now? And I think one way we can find out if we skip down to verse 13, I think this helps us as a litmus test. Verse 13 says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. We'll pause there. So if Jesus is Lord and Savior, if you have full surrender, if he has your heart, then do as I did. And so you're thinking, okay, like serve people. I can, if I'm on the coffee team. It doesn't seem too crazy. I could do that. No, no. Verse 16 is so loaded. Catch this. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. And it goes on. It says a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. So in short, you ain't above or too good for the things I just did. What what did he just do? He not only humbly got down and served the ones that love him and follow him or are loyal to him, but he also got down and served the ones that had a knife to put in his back moments later. Like he gave Judas the seat of honor on his left around the dinner table, knowing moments later he would betray him and sell him out. That's the kind of love Jesus is calling you to. In verse 16, in light of everything Jesus did, the call is you no longer get to weigh who deserves your love. There's no scales. Who deserves your time, your energy, your resources? All that is out the window. I remember coming back on a trip from Vegas. Don't judge me. It's a cheap vacation for family. And I remember being at the gate waiting to get in my, on my airplane. And the kids are going crazy. I'm a little stressed. I'm tired. And this guy beside me, he taps my shoulder. And he asks, can I borrow your phone? And I turn around. This guy is like 
jacked and he's ripped and he has tattoos all down his arms, he's up his neck and in his face he has a tattoo that says self-made. And he has slick back hair, he doesn't even have any luggage. And I'm like, okay, be a good pastor. Like, yeah, no problem, here's my phone. And I'm like sitting on the edge of my seat because I'm totally judging him, like oh, this guy's gonna take off my phone. Um, but then I listen in the conversation, this guy starts weeping and he's crying and he's sober and he's, I realized that he just got out of jail 6.30 this morning. He's on the phone with his, his wife or his, his mom. And so we, we struck up a conversation. We're talking about life, future plans, all this stuff, mistakes in the past, clean start, we're talking about our kids and he's excited to he, see his. And I just run out of questions to ask him. So I asked the dumb question, I'm like, what's prison food like? And he's like, yeah, it's terrible. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, and, and I remember, and then he talked about how he actually hasn't had a meal since he's left prison. And I'm like, this guy hasn't had outside food in six years. Now I'm getting excited. And I'm like, I can buy you your first meal. So we, I'm like, bro, whatever you want. We're walking around the airport. I'm like, just name, we go to the cave, we can go to that. We can do like fine dining. He's like, Bur he's just Burger King. <laughs> so we're like, we're doing Burger King. And so, and I like, he's choosing like fries. I'm like, no, 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 go nuts, man. Like, so he, he gets like multiple meals and all this stuff. And like what left a guy, he started as distraught, weeping. Now he's energized, ready, excited about the future with two supersized Pepsis in his hand, <laughs> excited where I left him. It wasn't me preaching to him. It wasn't me trying to shift his worldview. It wasn't me doing anything. It was just me simply serving him. That's the impact. We can make. We want to change culture. That's a value at Village Church. It's not going to be through Facebook rants. It's not going to be through political allegiances. It's going to be through doing what no one else will do. Getting lower than anyone else and serving anybody, just like Jesus did. And when you start putting parameters on who deserves your time, your affection, your service, you miss out on what God has right in front of you. And so let's look for those opportunities. Verse 18, moving on. We gotta go quick. There we go. This is crazy. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I've chosen, but the scripture, the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. It sounds odd, but in that historical context, that's like the worst thing you can do at a dinner. But to put your heel, it's still like in different cultures today. That's super offensive. That's a place of rejection and shame. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. This is crazy. <laughs> the way God chose something to be fulfilled before time existed, the way God chose for people would believe that he is he, is that he would be shamed. It, God's, the way God convinced the world to believe he is God wasn't through honor, glory, praise, trumpets, blazing, any of that stuff. It was through God would be shamed. God won you over through the road of shame, rejection, ultimately death on the cross. And in this moment, this isn't sitting well for Jesus, knowing his death is coming soon. After he's saying these things, Jesus was troubled. That word is terrasso. It means deeply anguished. It's the same word in the waters of Bethsaida that are being stirred up and chaotic. This is his mental state right now. Like God, it, Jesus is not in a good place. Like think about this. God was mentally and emotionally distraught in this moment. And what that does is those who are dealing with battles of anxiety and mental health, it just gives you, this text gives you a little bit of permission just not to be okay. Like, let's be honest, anxiety is the biggest mental health issue right now. It's, it's invaded 40 million people across the United States. That's 20%, one in five people in the United States have some shape and form of affected by anxiety. The stats aren't much different in Canada, and that's a growing stat. When I was young, I was, I was a small little guy. I was like five foot one, until I was about 16, 17. I still have like stretch marks. You could, I'm not gonna show you, but like, from, I grew so fast. And I was 5'1", I was going into probably the most like vicious and violent high school at that time uh, in Lower Mainland, Killarney Secondary. It actually made the news like two weeks ago because of, there was a w potential weapon there. They were really close to putting metal detectors in the hallways of my school. Gang warfare was rampant in that school. And I'm this 5'1", little guy trying to navigate like high school. And I remember this gang, the toothpick gang, on like one of the first days they said, hey, we know your brother, you're with us. And I'm like, 
Yes, I'm with them. I'm good, I'm good with these guys. Keep me safe. Now, and what that did is it built a little bit of an anxiety in me. I remember I had this weird thing that developed where I, I would get anxious about going to new places. I have no like really particular things about where the washrooms were, where the exits were. I always was anxious about my future. But this isn't a crippling thing just for youth. Currently, right now, three out of 10 of my closest friends um, have either had medication or doctor intervention around their anxiety. I remember listening to like the, the two most recent podcasts on like leadership, two pastors I really aspire to be like in a vacuum, different series. They're both talking about how they got struck down with panic attacks. One of them was walking the highway aimlessly because he couldn't drive and he's breathing frantically. The other one, 4 a.m. in the morning, is curled up in a ball and his wife is just patting his back because he's having a panic attack. He doesn't know what to do. This isn't a peripheral issue which just people just aren't tough enough and don't have the resilience to get through life's heartaches. No, no, no. The most compelling and competent leaders are being struck with anxiety. And this text, no longer you have to feel the guilt or shame or need to put on this act and fit in of all places the church. Like if one out of five of you is struggling with this, this text, what Jesus does is he shows a level of vulnerability to his disciples and in turn invites us to do the same. Like to be a church where no matter what you're doing with, whether it's through freedom session, community groups, or counseling, we can say you are enough and you can be broken and you can be both. It's okay not to be okay. And this place of all places can be an environment for that. And so why is Jesus so distraught? Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. God jumps into the world and allows himself to betray. Betrayal by not only anybody, one of his closest friends. This isn't a God that stays removed and just emotionally removed from anything we're going through. He jumps into our mess and feels and knows and experiences the pain that we're going through. It's in this case, betrayal. It's no secret some of you have walked through and have scars or open wounds from what betrayal has done for you. It just derails you. Some of the closest people in your life, like divorce. There's friends right now I know are navigating divorce, like people my age. It's the one after the next. But, but people in this church, too, I've had the honor of walking through with some of you, navigating diverse and, and, the, and the heartache, you, the person you're supposed to spend the whole life with, you gave everything to, is now betrayed you. And you, you feel like you're just constantly losing these legal battles. I've, like some of you I've talked to, just like you're clinging on to items in the house that you didn't care about six months ago just because you want a win. You want to gain some ground. Betrayal just disrupts everything for us. And all those emotions and pain and anger and rage that's legitimate, it can't be housed anywhere but the shoulders of Jesus. Like there's a type of anger that I cannot carry that will burn me alive and make me into a cynic. It will fill me full of rage and that will be cemented into a hand. I'll just have a chip on my shoulder. There's a type of emotion and anger I just can't carry on my own. And Jesus invites us. This is the beauty of him. He invites us in 1 Peter 5, cast your anxiety on me because I care for you. I want it. Why does he want it? Because he alone can carry what we cannot. Nothing else in this world, whether wholesome, family, friends, therapists, counseling, all this stuff, or toxic, alcohol, drugs, sex, you name it, has the underpinning has the foundation to carry the pain that you were walking through but Jesus. And some of the greatest comfort, I think, comes knowing when the God of the universe, who is still marked with scars all over his body, comes down and just sits in our pain with us. And the only words he provides us is, I get it. I get it. No other religion, worldview, ideology comes close to offering a fraction of that kind of comfort. And what is Jesus' response to his betrayer? Here we go. Skipping to verse 26. Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he whom I give the morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he dipped the morsel, he gave to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. 
This is what some scholars call the final act of mercy, or the final act of love. Knowing Jesus did not have his heart, knowing he'd be betrayed soon after, Jesus gives Judas an ultimate, a final decision. This act of mercy, what are you going to do? And what one author says, for one last lingering moment, Judas' destiny hangs in the balance as the love of God incarnate shines one more time in his benighted heart, but the moment is no sooner present than it passes. As Judas, in a final act of defiance, closes his heart against the light and turns away into darkness that has no end. And if this is your first time at Village Church, maybe you got invited by a friend, or you're just watching this, you saw some ad and you clicked, and you're now watching this sermon, you need to know that Jesus' invitation to you is always open. Whether you've marked yourself or someone else has marked yourself as someone like Judas, like a traitor, whatever identity you've given yourself, a, a pervert, a bad parent, someone who's greedy, narcissistic, a cheater, Jesus' response to you is the same and the offer is the same to you as it was to Judas, right to the bitter end. But there is an end. Jesus places the question on you like he does everyone. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with my invitation? And we see Judas' response. Verse 27. Then after he'd taken the morsel, Satan entered him. Woo. It goes, gets heavy. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do it quickly. So after receiving the morsel, skipping down to verse 30, the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. Okay, this gets, goes crazy quick. The devil entered him. Like maybe there's like a visceral reaction. Like he can do that? Like that's, can he do that with me? Like I actually believed that when I was younger. I remember watching Ghostbusters and it seemed like ghosts like possess people from like behind and they're like, wow and they get filled up and they're like talking as the ghosts are walking around. I'm like, the devil can legit do that. And so I'm always like on guard. And maybe that's the case, but I think he's more nuanced than that. Not to belittle this moment, but instead of worrying if the devil can do these kind of abstract, obscure, and unique things, let's look at the bigger problem of what he does in our lives on a daily basis. His job isn't to win you over as some devil worshiper that sets up weird things and symbols in your bedroom and start worshiping him. That's not the goal. The job of the devil is to make you into a liar, a gossiper, a cheater, someone who has bad theology, someone whose worldview is twisted, something that's more narcissistic and centered around you. That's the win for him. And it happens through these subtle moves, simply making small, usually unnoticeable tweaks in your thinking with planting lies and doubts that are sugar-coated with the good life all of it really just to lure you away from any loyalty to Jesus. How? How does he do this to us? How is he doing this to us? John Mark Comer, I think he frames it really well, he explains it as the devil's primary scheme to drive the soul and society into ruin is deceptive ideas that play into disordered desires which are normalized in sinful society. Okay, those are big words. Let's talk about this for a minute. I'm gonna use some like, if you've been in the church for a while, I'm gonna use some like probably cringy words that we've like moved on from because like, we've overused and probably misused some of these words. So deceptive ideas, that really is the devil. Most of scripture frames him, gives him the name, the father of lies, which translates to the origin point of deception. All deception in the entire universe comes from him. Jesus describes him when he lies. He speaks his native language. John 8. This is a vastly different framework than a lot of us think about how the devil interacts with us. Our understanding of how the devil interacts with us pretty much is like the low bar of like if something bad happens in our life. Somehow the devil's involved. So you're driving to church with your wife and you're fighting over what paint colors to choose for the bathroom. And you're like, it's the devil. He's getting between us. Like he's trying to prevent us from going to church, whatever the thing. Maybe, maybe the devil visited your minivan. But I would argue that maybe he's a little more nuanced than that. Breathing half truths when our guard is down on a daily basis. Maybe it looks more something like this. Those who are working. Man, you've worked hard. You worked hard for that promotion. Look. It's not really compromise. Think about what you can provide for your family. They deserve to be taken care of, don't they? You never got to have vacations growing up. Don't you want your kids to experience that? 
Look, everyone in this industry does. It's kind of expected. What about marriage? Look, you deserve to be happy, and you haven't been happy for a long time. You married young, we get it, but now you're more self-aware, and you know really what you need. And if you separate with your wife, you can, you can both really find happiness in someone else. You never know what's out there. Don't, don't you want your spouse, your partner to be happy? What about sex? Look, the Bible, it's got some really good stuff in it. Really good things to say about certain things. But let's be honest. This book is pretty ancient. Saving sex for marriage? Come on. Really? Like, it's a fairly outdated and oversimplified idea, right? Like, relationships are much more complex and nuanced than that. This is 2022. Okay. Let's move on. These ideas that circle our mind, why, why do they take root? Because they resonate with something in us. These disordered ideas, also known, the Bible calls it the flesh. <laughs> There's a word we haven't heard in a while. The flesh. It's that as we're being sanctified and trying to choose Jesus every day, there's still a part of us that needs to be put to death. Colossians 3, 5, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, what scripture calls the flesh, these disordered ideas that appeal to our selfish nature, the things that are not in alignment with the way of Jesus yet. And the devil craftily pulls on these threads that the areas of our life that still convince that we know better than God. It's that back door to a heart that hooks into our desires and our way of thinking and pulls on them. They're not convinced of the way of Jesus and are open to conversation, open to dialogue around the ideas that the devil offers. That's how the flesh operates. And here's the, the trifecta of deception, the third, the kicker here. This is sinful society, also known as scripture calls it, the world. The world. All of these ideas flushed out through our lives. This is really what the world is. Deceptive ideas flushed out through broken people, cemented into a way of life. It's the thing that's proclaiming a big amen to these ideas. And our cities, our values, our infrastructure, our systems, our culture is now, it's seeped into all this. And John, of all people, especially all of scripture, warns us, don't fall for the flavors of the world. Don't be deceived. Now, you feel hopeless yet? <laughs> this incubator of deception. Here's the beauty. Jesus enters into the incubator and doesn't succumb to this deceptive cycle that the devil offers, but instead has total victory over it. Jesus didn't just die on the cross for your sins, but to have victory over these three things. Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You want to disarm the enemy? By dying. The devil, thinking he won, pierces Jesus with his fangs that go deep into his body. But in turn, Jesus breaks and disarms and defangs the devil in all his power. That's what happened on the cross for your sake. So for us who have hope in Jesus, the beauty of what Jesus has accomplished for us and the way out is these deceptive ideas is Jesus has disarmed all power of the devil and invites us and gives us the power to be led by his truth, not by deception. The flesh, Jesus lived a perfect life showing us what it truly means to be human modeling something beautiful for us and calling us to be a new creation empowered by the Holy Spirit to actually live what it means to be truly human as well. The world. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And he invites us to be salt and light to show what the new kingdom, the way of life is supposed to look like for the rest of the world. Jesus has overcome all these things. And Jesus jumps into this incubator of deception and punches a way out and invites the whole world to come along. That's what he did on the cross. And because of what he did, none of us, None of us watching this, none of us in this room, no one ever has to follow suit in the same way that Judas did where it says he went out in the night in verse 30. He was deceived and he left Jesus. Instead, the only appropriate posture is to take one like Peter, 
Lord, all of me. Wash all of me. Wash all my ideas, wash all my worldview, wash all my theology, wash all my sin, my pain, all of me. And that's what Jesus invites us to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have punched a way out of this. You didn't leave us hanging to left our own devices that we thought we knew best. We thought we, were, we had the best ideas in the room. We, we left in an incubator of deception. No, no, no. You came down. You overcame all the lies. You didn't succumb to them for our sake and show us a way out. Would that create a sense of desperation in us? That we can't fool ourselves into knowing what is good and right. We can't fool ourselves into thinking we know best, but we are deeply dependent on you leading us. But you lead by serving us, by washing our feet. Now, would you help us live that life? No, we're never above anyone in this world. But we'll serve the least of these. We'll serve anyone that you place in front of our way. Because that, at the end of the day, has the most impact for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.